everybody. Hold on just a second. Sharing my screen. Here we are. So you present. So this is just going to be a quick um, rundown on how to take portraits. Um, if you've taken any other photo classes, you've probably seen this. If you haven't, then this is a good, I think, uh, tutorial on how to take um, a nice picture of somebody. Um, this is going to go well with your environmental portrait project. Um, I will speak about what the environmental portrait is, um, but mainly this is gonna be a rundown on um, kind of the history, history of portraiture uh, within the photographic medium. So let's get started. Um, one of the first images ever made um, was of uh, a human accidentally. Um, so this is a, um, an early image called a daguerreotype. Um, the official invention or the announcement of the invention of photography was around 1839. Um, Louis Daguerre was one of several individuals that was lending um, their um, method and process of uh, creating uh, a photographic image during this time period. And they took an image of uh, the Boulevard de Pomp in uh, Paris. Um, this was a very long exposure and it's weird that such a busy um, uh, area would be, be seen completely uh, erased or void of people, right? Well, what happened is that this was such a long exposure that it all of the movement of the people erased um, the individuals that were, um, that were there. Uh, the only person that stayed for this 10 to 15 minute exposure was someone right here, if you could see my cursor, down the lower left-hand corner, um, getting their shoe shined. They stood still long enough to um, have their imprint made on the final image. Otherwise, we would have seen a ton of wagons and people walking up and down the street. We would have seen horses, et cetera. We would have seen this. In some way we see there are people here, but they're invisible. They did not, uh, um, stay still long enough to be captured onto um, the final uh, print. So that's what considered the first um, first image of a person um, in photography. Um, the first selfie or self portrait was uh, made by an American. Um, the daguerreotype was um, imported from uh, from France um, by. Uh, the inventor Samuel Morse, and Morse taught a lot of people, um, including uh, Matthew Brady and um, some other folks. Um, if you're taking history of photography right now, you already know this, but um, Cornelius was another um, one of these uh, early practitioners and uh, of the photographic process and was one of the first people to put the camera in front of themselves um, and take an image. Um, so yeah, the first uh, selfie was uh, taken around 1839. Um, so we have many different processes, uh, many different ways of photographing. Um, it was very formal and there was a lot of kind of mimicry of painting and there was a lot of um, trying to uh, classify itself as a fine art, classify itself as a document, classify, it was basically, photography in itself was the invention of the industrial revolution. And it served many different functions as it does today. Um, it wasn't just a monolithic way of, um, of it wasn't just a monolithic tool. Um, it's only used in one specific way. Uh, we're like in this class, we're using it as a, as a form of visual journalism. 
there's also methods of art photography there's also scientific imagery there's also it's it, it can be used in in multiple ways um so in the mid 19th century we have kind of this um idea of creating mimicking art and so we have two examples uh one by julia Barker Keel and one by uh peter henry anderson as well um, so yeah, um, all kind of showing, um, not telling and more poetic, more um, trying to evoke emotion, evoke um, a, a genre, a scene. It wasn't supposed to be a document. It was supposed to be um, seen as, as a piece of art in a way. And then we have um, um, at the, the same time, kind of like, uh, you know, other modes of art image making. Um, you have Henry Peach Robinson here with this image called uh, uh, Fading Away, uh, which is combination print. There's five different negatives in uh, to make this positive up. Um, this would have been a shocking image to uh, 19th century um Europeans specifically uh because it is uh, showing a very private view it's showing death uh or someone that is about to die death was a very private matter um and this was also a forgery uh this was not a a real image um uh, it was I don't want to say forgery it was more uh the better word is um um It, it, it was uh, um, put together. Um, it wasn't a real life event. It was something that was, um, uh, I can't think of the words, um, conceptually put together, orchestrated, a tableau, that's the word I'm trying to think of. Um, it, it, was, it was a uh, representation of death, not an actual scene of death. And, Photography has had this long outstanding tradition of it being considered uh, truth. We all know that's false. Um, the, the a photograph lies as much as um, anything else. Um, and um, it's because it is so close to how we see and view things. Um, and the representation is so accurate of ourselves and, our, and the environment that we live in that we want it to be true. As but there's been manipulation of the craft um, ever since its invention. And um, Robinson was just trying to, you know, take this genre scene of death um, and apply an artistic spin to it, and it was received. Um, horribly by uh, by audiences and critics um, because of uh, it was too close to life. It was too close to showing an actual thing that was happening. They were, they were being lied to and deceived. Um, so yeah, that's, that's just kind of a little tidbit of history here. Uh, here we have an image by um, uh, to a duo um, named uh, Hill and Adamson took um, some great uh, kind of early art images uh, out in, um, in public. Um, there was a lot of studio work at this time. They were kind of some of the first kind of to get out of the studio and to photograph people on the street. Um, but the common thread with, um, that we're seeing here is kind of uh, a posing technique. How do we, uh, thinking about um, how do we place the individual? How do we evoke emotion? How do we, uh, it's all about uh, balance. It's about composition. It's about um, an atmosphere that is um, evoking emotion and a purpose for what, everything that's within the frame. And this is something that we do in oh, all the other arts, right? Too, if we're in painting and sculpture, we, we, there's there's this compositional balance. Um, 
So thinking about that um, at this point, thinking about light, thinking about, uh, we see the very heavy chiaroscuro that's happening here in uh, this image. Um, yeah, it's, uh, we'll, we'll keep talking about that. Um, some other early imagery, um, we have one by the French uh, studio photographer named Nadar. Um, he had this whole, um, uh, I'm losing words today, um, advertisement campaign that essentially uh, created, had this uh, um, clown named P, uh, P Perot, the clown, and Perot did uh, kind of all these kind of mimicking things, mimicking the photographer named R, um, uh, playing it up in front of the camera. It's kind of one of the first quote unquote performances in front of the camera. Um, so um, yeah, it's, it's just an interesting series of images. Um, then we have, um, the most uh, photographed American in the 19th century was uh, Frederick Douglass, the abolitionist, uh, um, the uh, civil rights advocate, um, just a hero for black representation and also for uh, black freedom um, in the United States and abroad uh, during his lifetime. And he used photography as a means to kind of destroy um, um, stereotyped imagery of black individuals um, that could be really harmful, that could aid in um, dehumanizing and showing uh, black folks that um, they don't deserve equal rights. Um, and he, he was a strong believer that photography was a utilitarian uh, method in showing um, the uh, um, humanity of, uh, of black individuals. So um, took tons of images of himself in multiple different studios all across the United States. Um, there's a couple of, I think there's a lecture that you viewed for this class that I did on that. Um, but uh, if you're taking a history of photography, you definitely um, saw my lecture on that. So um, don't need to go too much further. It's just a cool thing. Um, portraiture, so the in invention of photography was really uh, a means to uh, mass produce imagery. Um, this was to mass produce imagery for, uh, for pottery, to, for um, other kind of craft arts, um, instead of hiring, um, people that could draw and people that could do drafting for uh, news and, um, and other stuff. Um, uh, and also a way to get the untapped market of um, the middle to lower classes uh, to, to get um, a cheap reproduction of themselves without painting them. Uh, photography was, that's really why it was in there. It was, it was invented for um, the way uh, to um, um, sorry, <laughs> I'm getting uh, out of track. Um, so uh, what was I? Uh, portrait for masses. Just a way for um, everybody to kind of attain a portrait because you had to be at the wealthy elite to generally have um, someone's uh, uh, portrait painted. Uh, photography was very relatively cheap. Uh, it got cheaper as, um, as the technology advanced. So um, yeah, that's why um, that's why it became a thing. Um, you have this thing called uh, a carte de visite, um, as well as later the cabinet card, one small, one's big. It's kind of like a calling card in some way, um, a way to have um, small little pictures on um, 
piece of cardboard um, that was glued together that would be that could be shared. Um, does dairy is the one that is uh, coined with creating the carte de visite. Um, uh, it, it became a huge sensational thing. Um, Matthew Brady, um, who's really known for his Civil War work, um, he uh, he had a studio both in New York and Washington D.C. And uh, the one in New York was near um, a P.T. Barnum um, museum and also a sideshow uh, that was there. And he photographed um, the circus acts that would come in. And one of the most famous widely distributed images that he did was called um, the Fairy Wedding, which was uh, these two individuals that uh, are smaller people and uh, they got married. Um, and this is widely circulated. Um, what does Derry did with his camera was that he had um, eight different lenses on one camera and one plate behind that. And each thing would be a um, view would be a, a different frame. So you would have that, you would have one negative, you would place that and make a positive on um, a sensitized piece of paper, cut them out, glue them, and then give them to the client. Uh, it's just a, a cheap way to make multiple images, multiple views uh, to make um, the viewer happy. And this is all before film. Uh, this is, this is uh, still kind of wet plate, getting into dry plate uh, photography. Um, so we have um, an image of um, John Quincy Adams. Um, this is considered um, the first American presidential portrait, um, died in 1843. Um, yeah. um, you can see how he, what, how what they put around him is how. Um, uh, most paintings would have been. So kind of like a chair, books, dignified look, um, knowledge, power with the hands, stern look, fireplace, all of this kind of showing wealth and power um, and knowledge. Um, this was something that would have been used in painting and photography with just mimicking that. Um, at the turn of the 19th or turn of the 20th century, sorry, um, we have a lot of um, uh, advancement in the invention of photography. And that the biggest advancement being uh, George Eastman creating um, basically a, a means for everybody to be able to take photographs. And um, this is with the Brownie camera. This is with um, other box cameras that he comes out with. Uh, their motto, Kodak's motto, his company being, uh, you click the shutter to do the rest. That meaning um, they'd give you some roll film. I put it in your Brownie and you would take um, a series of uh, 12 exposures You'd send it back to Kodak. They would uh, develop them for you and also give you prints of each image. And they would all be of this kind of circular fashion right here. Um, and then uh, they would put um, film back into the box for you and send it back to you. And this kind of revolutionized. Uh, this was kind of um, our way of for starting everybody being able to be a photographer because it was kind of exclusively um, something that was done by um, rich individuals um, during the 19th century um, where you had a studio or you worked for a big company of some sort um, it, and you were a photographer that way. Um, it wasn't until uh, the 1900s that um, anybody can really just pick up a camera and kind of know what to do. Still some, some work, but this is kind of revolution. A uh, hundred years later, this, this idea 
gets transferred to our iPhones, our way of um, visual communication becoming a lot easier. So um, our sensibilities change as well um, in the 20th century with um, the advancement of, um, of, of the photographic medium. Um, we have this idea of pictorialism that pops up, which is again, kind of the advancement of uh, photography as a fine art form and then straight photography movement meaning that um, the photograph uh, is a photograph for photograph's sake um, utilizing every uh, sharp attribute as possible so we have a straight image right here um, this very modern way of looking at um, at everything uh, Immigration and it being kind of poetic and industry and um, urbanization and all that stuff. And also it being um, all of the aspects of the frame being really cut and clear. And then, um, then you have this pictorialist image where they focus more kind of on romanticized images, more egalitarian imagery, um, okay with, um, being more impressionistic looking, um, showing uh, the frame being maybe in the background more blurred. Um, this is by Gertrude K. Sevier. Um, yeah. So let's talk about the rise of the environmental portrait. So the rise of the environmental portrait happens kind of like with the advent of straight photography and also the advent of um, uh, photography becoming really the chosen medium uh, for uh, for news. So this happens really at the turn of the 20th century and skyrockets with um, tabloids, the uh, the advent of Life magazine, um, National Geographic, uh, everything that came with the history of um, photojournalism that I, I gave you. Um, the 20th century was really where uh, this skyrockets, this idea of uh, what is an environmental portrait, meaning um, that it's um, a document of your life. We're showing something that's happening in real life. Um, it might be staged um, at, at some level. But it's really it's revealing um, something about uh, the individual and something that they're doing. Um, so uh, environment being we are in the environment of the person that we're taking the image of, and um, this says something about them. This becomes newsworthy, this becomes document worthy, all of that stuff. So um, to the left, we have a Gordon Parks image. Um, you read one of his uh, photographic essays um, uh, on Harlem. Um, this is called Emerging Man. Um, so him, it's a play off of uh, Ralph Ellison's uh, Invisible Man. Um, black individuals in the 20th century, um, mid 20th century, not feeling like uh, they were human because of Jim Crow, because of not civil rights and uh, all that stuff. Um, so this was a mer like instead of invisible, I, I am emerging, I'm becoming visible in some way. Um, and so that's kind of saying something about the person. This was a part of a photo essay that he, he did in Harlem. Um, and yeah, really who coined this term was the photographer of, of the environmental portrait was this uh, person named Arnold Newman uh, who took photographs of tons of uh, kind of high towering figures during the 20th century. Um, here we have the uh, composer and pianist uh, Igor Stravinsky. Um, a portrait next with the piano's um, top being opened. 
and it becoming almost like a note. It become almost like a sculpture in a way. And we have Newman down here in the corner. So this is saying something about the towering, uh, the thing that is greater than Igor in some way is his music, right? And that, that's what we're showing right here. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's, it's just how do we manipulate someone within their environment um, to take a great image of them? And there's multiple compositional skills that we'll, we can uh, get from that. Um, rule of thirds, this is very much a rule of thirds image. Um, uh, you can center the person. Um, not a ton of background noise normally. Um, all that fun stuff. So we'll keep going on that. So uh, another two kind of famous images from uh, the Great Depression. We have one by Walker Evans and one by Dorothea Lang. Um, this is of a family in Hale County, Alabama. And this is the famous migrant mother image. Um, just the way she's looking away and how her kids are kind of cowering and um, the look on her face and all this stuff, it, it says it's something indicative about the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl. And it was a way to, it was published in life. It was a way to kind of manipulate the emotions of folks. Um, and if you look at the, um, and this is like this with most images. You look at the, the contact sheet of the photographs. She did not look like this. It took, this was kind of just like an off hand, like it, just like an accident, decisive moment image that uh, Lang made of this individual with their kids. Um, so uh, this is more direct, the, the gaze. Um, is pointed directly into the camera. Um, we can feel the emotion, but it's a little bit more um, ownership of, of uh, the individual here in this image. Um, yeah. So just thinking about how we set up, how do we get someone to kind of show how, what body language says a lot about the image and also kind of um, the power that it's going to evoke, the emotion it's going to evoke uh, within the photographic frame. Um, sometimes we do want to have kind of a background uh, that um, says something that's happening. And, th and this is uh, an image by Margaret Bork White. Uh, and this is of um, Black individuals uh, in the 40s, I believe. Uh, after a flood in Louisville, uh, Kentucky, uh, they are lined up to get food and uh, a relief. Um, and you have them lined up trying to, you know, be fed and, you know, get clothing and uh, relief funds for what happened to them. And then you have this uh, white way of uh, wealth and prosperity and um, yeah, just kind of showing the, the dichotomy that's happening. World's highest standard of living. Well, is it really, you know, we're questioning what the American dream is and who is it really benefiting and who, um, who really reaps, um, um, who reaps the, the, the most from uh, the system that is devised in this country. Um, in the 60s, um, there's this development of street photography, meaning that uh, so there's photographers on the street that are um, taking people's portraits, sometimes with permission, sometimes without permission. And um, it's because at this point we have extra, faster shutter speeds. Our film uh, is uh, more sensitive to light. We can take quick, great photos. We don't have to have giant bulky cameras anymore. Our camera's gotten a lot smaller. That's from uh, the Leica camera 
coming to Advent as well as, um, uh, yeah, just we have greater uh, um, uh, advances within the medium. And we have two um, examples of a street image, um, one by Dean Arbus, uh, both of these uh, medium format images. Um, Arbus, I think, generally talked with those that she photographed. Um, and then we see a Vivian Mayer image. And this is more of a um, what are you doing type thing that's happening. Um, the camera being down here, uh, looking down uh, at a waist level viewfinder, and then taking the image, maybe looking up and then taking the photograph and meeting eyes with the individual after. Um, Arbus was more interested in the person. Um, Mayer was more interested in the photo um, and maybe not getting as close to the individual without actually getting to know them. Um, other examples uh, of street images during this time period, one by Winogram, one by Friedlander. Is there permission? No. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, keep going. So we have kind of editorial and war um, photographs. Uh, I've talked about the one here by Ouija. Um, I haven't talked about Robert Kappa, I don't think as much. Um, Kappa was uh, a war correspondent and was the one who took uh, images of um, people, uh, the first wave of American troops uh, landing in Normandy uh, during World War II and um, so we, you've probably seen these images before. And a lot of people say uh, that there's a blurriness to them because um, Robert Capo was shaking because there were bombs and mortars going all around, off around him and people stepping on mines and people dying all around him while he's taking these photographs. Um, part of that is possibly true, but the, the real story with this is that um, he sent off his film to get processed um, in London. And they wanted to get this, you know, out in the news, uh, these images real fast. Um, so what they did was they, uh, one of the darkroom attendants was uh, forced into processing a lot faster than normal and uh, put um, the film in a dryer and pumped up the heat too high and the emulsion um, started to basically melt off of the film. Um, and that's what, what we get from these images uh, is kind of the, out of probably several dozen rolls of images that he took, we have about, I think, maybe 10, to 10 images, somewhere in that area, not very many that uh, survived. And that's what we got. And we almost didn't have any images from um, the invasion of Normandy on, uh, from Allied forces um, in World War II uh, because of one mistake of um, a darkroom uh, attendant in London. So that's what we're seeing. It's still, uh, it still shows kind of action and shows the accident actually enhanced the images in some way. Um, but yeah, that's what happened. Um, we have uh, Avedon here showing Andy Warhol after uh, he had been shot, um, sh showing kind of the horrific scarring from the surgery that he had to endure. Um, and then I have Margaret Bork White again showing um, um, concentration camp and uh, individuals being released in the 1940s. Very different images almost. Um, 
uh, portrait doesn't always have to show a face. I think that you can it can be hands, other parts of the body, um, getting really close, getting further away. Thinking about how we get close, how do we get close to our subjects? What are we trying to say about the image? Um, then we get into kind of like um, art imagery later on, um, and this is happening all during the 20th century as well. But um, we have uh, Epstein here. Color photography becomes very big in the 70s and 80s. Um, less of an advertising way and more of a utilizing uh, color as uh, a way, a means of uh, art imagery. Um, this some um, early 2000s photographs by the photographer Alex Soth. One of my favorite photographers, Renneke Dykstra. Um, what I love about her work, so if we see Alex Soth, we have, these are kind of very classic environmental portraits, the things around the individual say something about them. And this one's weird because this guy looks buff. He looks like he's like a, possibly a um, weightlifter, um, conscientious about his health, kind of this masculine uh, macho person. But then you have kind of these more quote feminine things around the individual. So it's, it's complicating the story a little bit. Um, his face is mimicking kind of the face of the dogs. Then you have this woman who um, is showing off her print of a cloud that looks like an angel and her hair being kind of higher hair, the closer you are to God, that, that whole thing. So living room, props, all of this saying something about the person. Um, Ricky Dykstra, does kind of the inverse where it's a void background. She doesn't show the background at all. And um, really what we are left with is um, how the individual is looking, what they're wearing, what, how is this telling the story? So this is a, um, a soldier in the Israeli army. Um, that's what this is about. Um, one of my favorite images uh, is um, called the Los Forcodos. And these are the people um, in Spain that would do kind of um, bullfighting. Specifically, these are the ones that would wrangle the bull after the fight um, that would happen. So she would photograph them after uh, they wrangled the bull. And they're in these, you know, nice kind of uniforms but then you know have been kind of gorged uh by a bull's horns or you know have blood all, all over them in the pool. not giving a lot of context but it's just uh if you just saw it without knowing the story you'd be like why is this person in really nice garb uh bloody what happens it's you're questioning um what's happening in the photograph so this is um I guess a mixture of environmental portraiture with art, um, kind of photography in mind. Um, I got to throw Wesley in here. Uh, one of my favorite photographers, Collier Shore. Uh, they have imagery of um, wrestlers in, uh, in high school. So kind of more Greco-Roman style wrestling. Uh, we have this high flash chiaroscuro image right here on the right and then kind of a zeroed in kind of um, image of uh, another individual. So how do we arrange an image again that close to front? How does the whole frame work? All that stuff. Sai so, Man, um, extremely uh, influential fine art photographer. Uh, she's famous for photographing um, her family, specifically her children. Um, this her husband and her son, eldest son. Um, she uses a view camera. She, a lot of her images uh, utilized um, uh, collodion process. Um, yeah, just think about the framing here. Think about how 
the waves or the, the water is like glass like almost and uh, it's the perspective the centering all that stuff that's how it works here so um okay so this is just for general rules on how to take a good image uh, people are horizontal um i mean that's wrong <laughs> people are vertical uh try shooting that way um the, you can try horizontal but uh i think generally this ratio up to down instead of side to side uh, is generally more flattering. Uh, try not to cut off limbs or heads unless, unless it is intentional and aesthetically pleasing. Um, be ambiguous, be creative, be abstract, take risks, uh, don't do expected. You have a, might have a perception on how to take a portrait, get, that, get rid of that perception. Um, and then specifically, you're gonna be shooting people in their environment doing this a lot. Uh, it's hard to take good images of people. People are the hardest subject to take images of. <coughs> they move. It's not easy. And um, you have to direct them. You have to be around them. There's a comfort level. Don't let anything behind them. Like you don't want to pull behind them. You don't want to to cut off weird at weird places like think about how you're framing framing someone um so for this we're thinking about people in their environment and um don't do this style this is commercial if you get your photography business up and running and start doing weddings and commissions for people's portraits cool this is great but uh don't do cheesy images. Uh, a natural smile, a natural laugh is way more uh, nice than um, a forced smile. This, this say cheese, we have this kind of reaction. Uh, this is how we pose for an image. Don't do this. When you get your commercial business up, do it all you want, but I don't wanna see this type of uh, photo photography of people. Again, it's not saying people can't smile. There's a difference between a cheese smile and a natural smile. Um, so here's some examples again from Dean Arbus and Howard Soth. Um, interesting images. Uh, don't really know what's happening in these at first, uh, but they, they tell a story, right? Same thing. Fun Park, Sign Man. Someone on stilts back here. So it's a candy cigarette, but you know, someone looking older than they actually are, looking older than they're having to deal with. Um, the gun being pointed, um, white and black relation, all that stuff. Uh, yeah. Um, Eggleston, one of his mother, Levitt, this is humorous. She's taking pictures, this is a straight image of people two all the way people walking across the street and you have these sport cars waiting for them <clears throat> nixon really close images um you have stacy kranitz who uh yeah person becomes sculptural almost this is funny um an image of by martin parr um of the lean tower pisa you might have been there if you've gone on the humanities tour and there's always people taking pictures of the same thing of either up holding up the the tower or they're pushing over the tower and martin parr just got a little bit higher like did a little bit of an angle change and then showed kind of how ridiculous these people look um right all doing this mimicking on the same thing and he's just commenting on that um Leibowitz, who's um was a photographer for Rolling Stone, um, photographed more musicians than anybody else, I believe. She took the last image of John Lennon and uh, Yoko Ono uh, before he was assassinated in, uh, near Central Park. Um, yeah, how do we pose people? How do we get close or far away? How much do we know the individual? All that stuff. So. 
Um, I would encourage you to get to know these people because you're going to be doing a story on them, right? So um, now I'm, I'm going to stop sharing and just speak. So get to know people, um, get to know them in their environments. This is a story about what they do specifically. Um, and um, you really need to capture their essence through image making and be careful about how you frame them, how you interact with them, all that stuff. Uh, also a good protocol is to get consent both verbally and uh, written. Um, I, I highly recommend that you get uh, a consent form and have them waive their right for you to uh, use their image. Um, I will post um, a template of that of that for you uh, in this in the notes for this. And um, yeah, I highly recommend that you put that off and have them sign it. That's just for legal purposes. It's something that we should be always doing um, when we photograph people, um, even if you know them really well. It's just uh, you you never know when you might get bit in the butt uh, later on. So precautions for yourself. Um, and for the other individual as well, it's as much as rights for you as it is for them. Uh, it gives them some rights as well. Um, it's just good, good practice. Um, since we're still around, you know, COVID uh, still happening, uh, I highly recommend that you don't shoot indoors, um, that you shoot outside. It's also just easier um, to shoot outside with um, with a manual setting, and if you're not using flash um, anyway, unless you have a lot of natural light that you're working with. And um, um, wear a mask. Um, have your have the person that you're photographing wearing a mask as well until you take the photograph of them. Um, I don't care if you've both been vaccinated. Um, this is just still good practice. Uh, I've done a couple editorials recently and this is the rules that major magazines are enforcing. So I'm gonna do the same thing that you, you're doing. So um, wear a mask the whole time and have them wear a mask until you take a picture of them, okay? So um, yeah, uh, there'll, there'll be some notes in this uh, section. Um, I want you to uh, write uh, a paragraph about what you learned, if you learned anything, slash um, ideas, brainstorming ideas of what you're gonna be doing for this project. And um, that'll be kind of, I'll be just expecting um, uh, imagery uh for this um by next week and um yeah that's that's the deal um i'm expecting a total of uh 24 images and then you're going to pick uh 10 to 15 of those to be uh in your um in your uh final project and a written portion on what the story is um captions all that fun stuff okay so if you have any questions let me know uh other than that uh, happy viewing thank you